Hey gang, welcome back to Embrace the Question. Steve here, and welcome to our own Bible study we're calling Bible Study with Me. We are on Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. I'm going to try to get these out on Tuesdays, Fridays, and Sundays. That's my goal, and so far in the last couple of weeks, it's been possible. I've been dodging noise from outside today, so I finally get a moment of silence, and let's see how far we can get. I want to invite you to subscribe. There's a reason why we all say that, and that is because it greatly helps the channel's visibility within the search engine that is YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing so. It will allow you to follow along with us and possibly find some things that you're looking for at a later date very easily. All right, let's go. Let's, well, I'm in the MKG. Let's be consistent and start out with the English Standard Version. Genesis 3.16. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he will rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In the pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. It has felt that way today. Verse 18. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Okay, let's stick to our five verse goal here, and let's try to break these down a little bit. We've just, we've just come out of the part where Adam and Eve both ate of the fruit of the forbidden tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and this is basically the, the judgment being pronounced upon them and upon the serpent. But uh, to the woman, he says, I'm going to multiply your pain and childbearing. That, that would indicate to me that she's already began the process of childbearing. Adam of uh, Cain and Abel have probably been born. And it was a painless experience. But now in pain you shall bring forth children. Okay, there's always the question, where did Cain get his wife? I will say that early on, Cain had no choice but to marry one of his sisters, and they would not have listed the sisters in the, in the lists of offspring because you just typically didn't unless there was something extraordinary about a certain... Uh, a certain child. And that does happen. It does happen. We'll find that in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. We'll, we'll see that. But typically that didn't happen. They listed the males because it was through the male that the bloodline typically went. Okay. So your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he will rule over you. Let's take a look at that in another translation. Let's flip over to the King James and just see what it says. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply. Okay, let's the second half of the verse. And they thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. You notice that they inserted contrary to your desire will be contrary to your husband but he will rule over you. I'm going to say that this particular passage isn't the clearest thing in the world to me. I believe what he's saying is that there, there was before now this, this freedom between the two of you 
that produced an attraction. Adam was attracted to you, you were attracted to him, and it was because there was no tension. Now there's going to be a tension between the two of you. One is going to want to dominate the other. One is going to want to have power over the other. And we see that. We see that a lot in society today. We have we have husbands that are very domineering. We have wives that are very domineering. Typically, this produces a family that isn't all that healthy. That is something that I think the Lord is saying here is going to happen, and you're going to have to learn to rule over that. You're going to have to you're going to have to agree to disagree about many things. Something that I don't think had been the case before the fall. Uh, I might like to come back and, and take another shot at some deeper meanings to this particular verse because it's a little bit cryptic to me, but it obviously has everything to do with a fallen mindset and insecurities introduced into both parties. So let's let's keep going and maybe we can get a little more resolution as we go. And unto Adam he said, because you have eat, you've hearkened unto the voice of your wife and have eaten unto the tree which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it, then cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow you shall eat of it all the days of your life. That's the King James, basically, with a little bit of Steve thrown in there. Uh, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. I am still sticking to my stance that Adam did this on purpose. He, he purposely bit into the fruit because he was afraid of losing his wife. Simply because... Later, we learn the scripture clearly says Adam wasn't deceived, so he did nothing out of deception. He did everything on purpose. We can say Eve was deceived. Adam was purposeful. On the one hand, that sounds pretty malicious, if not very rebellious. I don't think that's why he did it. I don't think he intended to be rebel rebellious, but I do think he was fearful. And it's... It's the natural, it's the natural uh, repercussion of, of sin if fear is introduced into the world. Okay, what happens? Curses the ground because of you. It's interesting that he was taken from the ground, and now the ground is cursed because of him. He, he was taken from the ground, and yet all of his sustenance came from the ground. In pain you're going to eat of it, the ground, all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. Okay, so things aren't going to be so easy. We're, we're, not in, we're, we're obviously leaving a place that food was everywhere. There were berries here, there were fruit, there were fruit to be picked here, vegetables growing here. And it, there was no work involved in, in gathering that, really. It was, they were just everywhere. Now things changed. Now we're battling thorns and thistles, things that you didn't plant. Wild things, things that perhaps existed outside of the garden, but now it looks like you're going to have to exist outside of the garden as well. So you're battling these things and it's not going to be as easy to have dominion over them. It's, it's very difficult now because the ground is cursed. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread. Right. It's, it's hard work to produce food from the ground. My in-laws are farmers. So I've seen firsthand how difficult it is to produce something edible. Something that the beasts of the field don't have their way with, right? It's also of, of note, I think, to start to, to have a picture of the second 
Adam. Who is the second Adam? It's Jesus. He overcame the curse. He's the one of which the prophecy is speaking, the one who will crush the head of the serpent. That was from the last session. Okay. Around his head was a crown of thorns. Why? Because that's part of the curse. And it's going to perish. That curse is going to ultimately perish with him. It's, it's not going to reverse everything all at once. But it is going to reverse it. Ultimately, it's going to put an end to the curse. We're, we're going to get to see uh, more, more details on that as we go, especially if we can make it to the book of John, right? The book of Matthew. We're going to get some real details on all of this and how it, how it pans out. How this gardener, God is acting as a mentor here to Adam, whom he's wanting to train up as a gardener. He's trying to make Adam a gardener. Adam fails. He gives up his dominion, which is prerequisite number one if you're going to be a gardener. You have to have dominion. But if you give that up, then there's nothing you can do about the garden. When we see Jesus appear, he appears as a gardener. Mary mistakes him as a gardener. That's, that's the resurrected Jesus, the, the glorified one. So now we see the second Adam succeeding where Adam failed. If we have this picture in mind the whole time, and we're always holding these in a bit of a juxtaposition, then we can pick up on a lot more things. So let's keep reading. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Seems straightforward enough. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Okay, that's an interesting statement. Let's see what Eve means. Go over to the King James. Eve. Uh, doesn't look like it would be pronounced Eve, does it? Shava. Or Kava. Life giver. Life giver. There are a lot of people that ask the question, could there have been people before Adam and Eve? Could there have been, could Neanderthal have happened before Adam and Eve? To which I say, no, I don't believe so, because Eve is the mother of all living, not animals, but all living humanity. And I base that belief on this verse. She's the mother of all living. So let's proceed to verse 21 here. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. Remember, he was, he was taken from outside the garden and placed inside the garden. And he drove out the man at the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Only four verses left here, but they are so full of information. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Why? Because their ability to clothe themselves with fig leaves was highly insufficient, especially when chatting with Almighty God who comes in a whirlwind. 
It's only when you're dealing with a whirlwind when you discover how insufficient fig leaves can be. Kind of like Kind of like hospital gowns, right? You're never covered as well as you think you are. Hospital gowns and insurance policies. All right, so he clothes them with skins. We find out all of a sudden that something had to die in order for Adam and Eve to be clothed. They didn't know what to do about it. They had never killed anything. God knew what to do about it. He killed something. I'm going to guess lambs or goats and made them skins, clothing. So he clothes them and Adam and Eve for the first time realizes that their action caused more than just their own death. Sin is like that. It causes death all around. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. One of us. There we go. Now we're back to the, the conversation about his name, Elohim. One of us. Remember, that's a plural name, Elohim. It, can be, it could be referring to him as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, which I've often, often thought that. I I've, I've guess as long as I've known that was really plural, that's what I believed. But there are other ideas out there that don't make poor sense. He could be speaking of, he could be speaking to the angelic hosts. Now they've become like one of us. Only that my problem with that is that the angelic hosts aren't really in the business of knowing slash understanding good and, good and evil. They're not really in that business. Their business is to do as they're told. We have a falling, a fallen remnant of angels that, that followed Lucifer, but they, they, I don't think they did it because they were weighing and measuring good versus evil. I think they did it because they decided to rebel against the rule of God. And that placed them on one side of the fence. The other angels were like, we will only do what you say to do. I don't know if that makes any sense to you or not. It makes sense in my tired brain. Okay, let's ponder that one. But now the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Let me, let me take that a step further. The reason they know good versus evil now is because they've eaten from a tree that only produces death. Remember, every other plant, every other tree was life. Eat of these and live. Eat of that one and you will surely die. So there is one way to surely die, and that is to all of a sudden introduce a choice. A choice, good or evil. Is it good? Is it evil? It's not that the choice in itself, it's, it's, it's the choice that Adam and Eve didn't realize was there before. Everything was life to them. There was no such thing as a choice, understand except there was just the command. Don't do that, do that. Now all of a sudden, everything is, wait a minute, is that good or is that bad? Is this okay or is this not okay? Is, and it's starting to sound like the law, isn't it? Now, now that we've eaten from that tree, we've got something going on that sounds a whole lot like the law of Moses. Oh, I can do that. Oh, I can't do I can't do that. That's good, that's evil. I can I can touch this, but I can't touch that. I can touch it today, but I can't touch it on the Sabbath. You see what I'm saying? So there's two trees. One I like to call pro-life and the other I like to call pro pro-choice. And it does apply to all this political stuff, but it 
it's and yet it's bigger it's it's a lot bigger because there is a mindset i think that we're missing and that is if we can hold life at the utmost priority prevalence in our own mind then things work out it's when we start to weigh and measure whether or not life is worth it or good and evil remember that there are some good things out there that can kill you there's a way that seems good unto men but in the end they lead to death that's what scripture says so way that seems good unto man seems good that seems good that fruit looked good it was pleasing to the eye and good for food according to eve seemed good mm, but in the end it led to death so now all of a sudden we have this extra set of variables introduced into our existence he's become like one of us in knowing good and evil so i'm asking you this does it mean he's become like we are or does it mean he's become Come like one of us. That is provoking to me. And I guarantee you, I have never seen that before, this very moment. Has he become like both of us, all of us, or has he become like one of us? Are we are we being victimized by the translation? That's verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us. As one. United. He's become united with us. Or alike. Hmm. That's got to be really difficult for you to see. It, it reads this way. Uh, let's see if I can... See if I can bring it up so you can see it. Echad is, is one. Um, but it's, it's literally the numeral one, Echad, I believe. Properly united, one. Alike, alone, all together. And any, a piece, a certain, each. Uh, Eleven. That's interesting, isn't it? Every few first highway a man i don't understand how some of this correlates once one only other some together well i think we're just going to have to think about that some more um and that's the beauty of the bible study but it is still provoking he has become as one of us to know good and evil and now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore he is sent forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Okay. So we don't want him in this state to put forth his hand and grasp a fruit that will prolong his current state of fallen mindset remember i i am not convinced that everything here is worded in such a way that it makes it look like god is mad i don't believe god is mad at at adam uh, so we noticed that back in this other this other translation the esv it says he, he was it's Okay, let me talk. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden. Oh, there we go. That's the one I was looking at. He drove out the man. That makes it sound like he was very angry. I'm driving him out. And I've seen I've seen it painted that way, you know, with the little stick figures and put on the felt board at in Sunday school. I don't believe God was angry. I think I think when he, when Adam left, I think God went with him. Um, I've I've heard this described lately as in the garden, 
God had, or, or Adam had complete access to God. Complete. In fact, he would visit daily with the Lord. He, the presence of God was a normality, a normality for Adam. So that when they met, they met on the table of the presence, which was the the or the mercy seat, the mercy seat of the uh, of the Ark of the Covenant. It was the heavenly version. That's where they met because there was no there was no separation in the garden between God's domain and Adam's domain because it was all kingdom. It was all God's domain. Adam was only perpetrating kingdom, and there had not been a fall. So where they met, where they conversed, was actually, and, and again, this was this is somebody's explanation that I had never heard, but it provokes me to no end. So they met at the mercy seat. All right, think about that for just a second as we take a look at this picture. So when Adam is driven away, it says that he drove out the man and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword. The flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. What's the flaming sword? Who's the sword? It's like, who's the sword? It's the word. It's the word become flesh. He's the sword. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. So this is just a different way to think about it. And, and I just want to introduce it to you. So what, when Adam turns around and he looks back at where he came from, he sees a flaming sword. Perhaps what he sees is Jesus, the glorified pre-incarnate Jesus, in his fiery glory, just much like John saw in Revelation, and he sees these cherubim. Where are the cherubim? They're on both sides. Of what? The mercy seat. The two angels that face each other on the mercy seat are cherubim. So now we have this picture. When Adam turns around, he sees what? He sees where he used to meet with God with Father, with Abba. And it's not to say you are expelled forever. It's to say, it's still here. I'm going to fix this and we will be together again. And that's really how I lean towards this. I believe that was always the case. I believe God was always not overly angry, if angry at all, with Adam because I believe Adam embraced this curse because of Eve. And I think God identified with that. He was willing to embrace a curse because of his fallen bride. <clears throat> and that's just my take. And I have room to waver from that. But so far, I haven't. So far, I haven't. This is... Uh, <clears throat> This is just something that's fascinating every time we tackle it. And it's uh, there's a lot to it, right? Because I, I intend to keep these around 20 minutes, and this one's probably, probably close to 40. So sorry about that, but I hope you're enjoying it. I'll have another one up for Genesis chapter 4 in the next couple of days. And uh, be sure and give me your thoughts. Tell me what I'm missing, because... Goodness knows I'm missing something. All right. Hey, you guys have a safe weekend and we'll we'll see you soon. Peace. <laughs>